Welcome to First Baptist Church of Glenard, where we're developing dynamic disciples.
God is indeed worthy of the highest praise. We say hallelujah to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Welcome to the very first Sunday in the month of July, 2020. I am Reverend Thea A. Wilson, and it is indeed an honor and a privilege to serve as your presider on this Sunday. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Malachi chapter number two, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 11. And while you're turning there, please share the link with anyone uh, in your family and friends. We want to share the great news of what God is doing here at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Malachi chapter number two, verse number 11. And the word of God reads, Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem for Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution which he loves he has married the daughter of a foreign god may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this being awake and aware yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah, the word of God is already blessed. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Lord, as we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, God, we are thankful. We're thankful, Father, that you are our refuge. God, we thank you for being our strong tower. God, we thank you that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God, we fear no evil. For your word tells us, Lord, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, God, that goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. And though we're not worshiping together here in the sanctuary, Lord, we dwell together in your house forever. God, please forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, for your word that's forever settled, Lord, and that will be brought to us, Lord, by our pastor. God, we thank you for the man of God. We ask that you anoint him and anoint the word, Lord God, so we will be more like you today than we were yesterday, Lord. Please draw by your spirit, Lord, those who need salvation, those who need reassurance, and those who need to recommit and need a church family, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for having heard this prayer. God, please perfect everything that concerns your people, Lord God. Your word tells us we don't even know what we ought to pray for, God. So we ask that you intercede. God, heal, set free, deliver, Lord God, and meet every need. Thank you, Lord, for hearing, and thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer of petition and praise. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, First Baptist, it is now time to give. We thank you so much for being such great givers. Your giving allows us to continue in ministry we have ministries meeting every day of the week. Thank you so much. Please give online or you can write a check made payable to FBCG. The ribbon with the address is right below the screen. Thank you again for giving. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for these gifts. We ask even now, Lord God, that you sanctify and that you bless them and that you receive them, Lord, as a sweet smelling aroma in your nostrils. In the name and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Now we will have a musical selection by our fellowship chorale. God bless you.
Hello everyone, I'm Lou Holder, DC area television personality and proud member of the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden family. Here's some events coming up at our church. FBCG is rolling out the red carpet for the area's hottest whips and motorcycles at the 15th annual Men Following Christ Car and Bike Show. This year's event will be a runway show. The coronavirus is not stopping this awesome event. Cars and bikes will cruise the course as viewers watch a live stream of the event online. Join us Saturday, July 11th at 9 a.m. for this exciting event for all ages. If you have a car or a bike that you want the world to see, register to participate in this free event, fbcglenarden.org forward slash car bike show. Then get your ride ready for your moment in the spotlight. There will be a blessings of bikes as we pray for the bike riders. While there will be no on-site spectators for this year's show, all are invited to watch as the vehicles take their place on the runway and our MC tells us about each ride's bells and whistles. To view the event live, visit fbcglenarden.org forward slash watch now or Facebook Live. Now, right after the car and bike show, men tune into the huddle this Saturday, July 11th at 10 a.m. on the church website where the theme is Black Wealth Matters. Gain insights for building your wealth as you hear from experts such as John Fort of CNBC's Squawk Alley, Lamar Tyler of Black and Married with Kids and Traffic Sales and Profit, and Alfred Edmonds Jr. of Black Enterprise. Don't miss this opportunity to learn to build your wealth 10X style. It's all about the paper. Fellas, not just paper for you, but paper for your kids and your grandkids and your legacy. All right, is your marriage thriving or just surviving? Does your marriage reflect godly vision? Join First Baptist Church of Glen Arden's Couples Ministry for part two of the series entitled Marriage Momentum, making the right moves that turns God's vision into God's reality for your marriage. It's going to be virtual Saturday, July 11th at 7 p.m. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time and a place for everything under the sun. Make sure you and your family are prepared for it all. Join us for this virtual exit symposium to ensure that you are not caught off guard by life's inevitable seasons. On Saturday, July 18th, from 9 a.m. to noon, participate in general sessions and workshops on a variety of topics such as wills, insurance, finances, funeral planning, and how funeral homes and cemeteries are operating during the COVID-19 pandemic. Learn from speakers such as Prince George's County's Register of Wills, Sarita A. Lee, Shakisha Morgan of the Griffin Law Firm, and staff from First Baptist Church of Glen Arden's Funeral Services Department. Whether you are a senior citizen or a young adult, now is a good time to prepare for your future. To register for this free online event, visit fbcglenarden.org forward slash exit plan. Join us on Wednesday, July 29th at 7.30 p.m. for our virtual church business meeting. We look forward to seeing you there as we conduct our church business as one body of believers. All members are encouraged to attend. Registration is required. Visit the church website for more details. That's the news for this week. You can find more details about these and other events on our church website, fbcglenarden.org. I'm Lou Holder. Continue to enjoy your holiday weekend and may the Lord continue to bless you. Thank you. And now it's time for the Word of God. It's time for us to determine how we level up and how we measure up to the Word of God. Please receive now the Senior Pastor of the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, Pastor John K. Jenkins, Sr. Praise God. Amen. Thank God for the worship of Almighty God. And thank you today for joining us today, wherever you are. 
I'm excited for the opportunity to worship our God. He's worthy to be praised. And I want to thank you for joining us wherever you are in the country or in the world. Before we dive into the word today, I want to do what we do every Sunday. We take a moment and we pray and intercede. And in particular, we pray for people who we love, who we know need the Lord Jesus in their life. And I want to invite you today to join me in just a moment of prayer, believing God to save and redeem and reclaim some souls who have not met the Lord or who have drifted out of fellowship with him so that his will will be done in their life. And I know you've got loved ones and relatives and coworkers and neighbors who you know need the Lord. So let's just pause for a minute and pray. Father, we thank you today. And we bless your name. Your name is worthy to be praised. How excellent is your name in all of the earth. And we humbly come before you today, praising you for what you have done in our lives. You have you've redeemed us. You've, you've washed us. You've saved us. You have brought us out of the miry clay. You have brought us out of our sickened, sin-filled conditions and brought us to have everlasting life with you. And for that, God, we're thankful, and we give you the praise and the glory, and we give you eternal thanks. As we pray for, and come before you today, God, we are praying today that your perfect will will be done in our lives. We humble ourselves before you and yield to your will that you will let your will be done, that that which you've decreed in heaven would be a reality every day in our lives. And we're praying for your will to be done in the lives of some unsaved people, some lost people, backslidden people. We call their names out before you. We have sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, neighbors and co-workers and relatives and friends who need your power and presence in their life. And we pray that you would interrupt their lives by the power of your Holy Spirit and arrest them and bring them into the kingdom of God. We thank you, Father, that you're inclining your ear to our prayer and that you're hearing our cry. We're praying that you would meet the needs of your sons and daughters today in the midst of the the dynamics that we face in our community and our culture, we pray, Father, that you would meet needs. You would meet the needs of your people, whatever those needs are. And, Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins. We acknowledge our transgressions before you. And we pray today that you put a shield of protection around the people of God. I pray today, Father, that you would put hedges around our families and hedges around our marriages and hedges around our sons and daughters and hedges around our businesses. And we pray, Father, that when it's all said and done, that we will be witnesses for your kingdom, that we're, when we finish the journey, matter of fact, while we're walking in the journey, that we'll be able to give your name and your kingdom the glory and the honor. Anoint us now for these next few moments to share this most difficult message with the people of God. Allow hearts to be open and receptive, Father, and to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for joining me in that prayer today. And uh, I've got to come to you today uh, from my office this, this day I'm coming. And uh, I want to talk to you today about a very difficult topic. Matter of fact, I know I'm going to make some of you upset and mad. I'm going to probably pisseth some of you off. That's a biblical term, by the way. Look it up in the King James translation. It's a Bible word. Uh, don't turn me off. Just hear me out for these next few moments. I want to talk to you. Grab your Bibles and walk with me. I want you to turn to the last book in the Bible, in the New Te Old Testament. I'm sorry. It's the last book in the Old Testament. It is the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And I want you to turn to chapter 2. And I want to do my final installment of this series I'm in on home. And I've been spending the last several weeks talking to you about home and family. And we've been looking at the elements that have created challenges and problems for our families and for our home to survive and make it. We've talked about those areas, conflict that were not able to be resolved and finances and we talked about money, money management, and we talked last week about sexual immorality. And today we talk about the thing that uh, has invaded our culture and invaded our homes and families, and it is unfortunately the, the component of divorce. I want to talk about 
divorce. And I, I, want, I want you to just hear me out today. I'm certainly not seeking to uh, make anybody feel shame or guilt. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna talk to people who are contemplating divorce, who are having troubles and challenges in your marriage. I wanna talk to you. I wanna talk about uh, those who have not gotten married yet, but you are con- contemplating marriage or you're looking forward to marriage. I want to spend a moment and help you see God's perspective on how God views and how God looks at the whole institution of marriage and how he feels about it. I think it's a very important uh, element and component to take a look at uh, before you do it. And so uh, this book of Malachi speaks to it. Now, what's important about the book of Malachi is that it is the last book in the Old Testament and God is giving some final words to the children of Israel before he will be silent for 400 years. It'll be 400 years after Malachi before God speaks again, before he has anything to say, before he shows up on the scene again. Here's his final words. And believe it or not, he has a lot of things to say. He talks in the book of Malachi about fathers and their children, and he talks about marriage. He has something to say about marriage. He has something to say about tithes and offerings and giving and serving. He has a lot to say in this book of Malachi. But I want to want you to go to chapter 2, and I want to I wanna look at uh, verses uh, 11 through 17. But let me pick up at verse 17. Let me, let me start at verse 17 because it, it, it says something there that I found alarming. I was startled to read this 17th verse of chapter 2. And what does it say? Here's what it says. This is, this is it. Look, listen to this. You have wearied the Lord with your words. You have wearied the Lord. That's the thing that captured my attention. Here's what startled me, that here's a place in Scripture that says that we have the capacity to wear God out, it says. You've wearied the Lord. I mean, out of all of the things... I would never think, when I think about the nature and the makeup of the God that we serve, can we actually wear him out? Can we weary him? Can we drag him down to where the God we serve is weary? But that's what Malachi says right here in verse 17. You have wearied the Lord. I know people get weary, but I'm shocked to see that the scripture says that God has gotten weary. And the question is, how does God get weary? He doesn't get weary easy. It doesn't happen quickly. As a matter of fact, the text says right here, look, look, look what is happening. It says, it says, you wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? How did we weary him? Here's how we do it. He says, you've wearied him in, in, in what way have we wearied him? Here's how you do it. In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. Stick a pen right there. He says, he says here's what's wearied God. He's wearied because you are saying the people who are doing evil, you're saying what they're doing is good. Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. That's what you say. That it's okay, that there's behavior, there are actions, there are choices, there are decisions that are being made, and you say it's okay. You're saying it's okay in the sight of the Lord. It's good in the eyes of God, but yet God calls it evil. And this has wearied God. This has brought him to a place of weariness and tiredness and frustration. And I dare to say to you today that that's what's continuing to go on today. People are wearing God out. And in order to get the full picture of what God is saying, we've got to back up and pick up at verse number 11. The question is, how have we worn God out? And what are are people doing that God says uh, is evil, but yet we say is good? Verse 11 says, Judah has dealt treacherously. And an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah, that's the people of God, for Judah 
has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. Stop. Stick a pin there. Stop for a moment. It says, Judah, the people of God, one of the tribes of Israel, one of the chosen people of God. And that, that would mean you and I today. We're the chosen people of God. And matter of fact, Judah is the tribe that has the assignment of praise and worship. And it says, Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. God doesn't have a whole lot of institutions. And, he, and one of them is the institution of marriage. He loves it. God loves the institution of marriage. Why? Because it is an example. It models the relationship between Christ and the church. It is, a, it is a, an institution that shows the relationship between a loving God and the people that he's chosen. And when people look at our marriages, what they're supposed to see is what it looks like between God and his people, between Jesus and the church. That's what's so sacred about the institution of marriage. It is a holy institution. It is not to be treated lightly, but yet the scripture says that Judah, the chosen people of God, has done something horrible. They have profaned it. They have cursed it. They have treated it lightly. They have treated it in the wrong way. You don't treat marriage like a car. You don't trade it in and get a newer model. You don't get frustrated with it and throw it to the curb. No, no. He says, you have profaned it. You have treated it in a wrong way. The Lord's holy institution, which he loves. But then he says this, and this is the problem. This is the issue. Jot this down. They have profaned the marriage institution. This is the thing that is, that the God, that the, the Lord that we serve says, you have treated it wrongly. You have profaned it. This is the thing that has brought weariness to God. And I find, and I want to just spend some time talking about this today because people are making decisions about marriage and they don't understand how sacred and holy our, the institution of marriage is. It's not something that you enter into lightly, but you enter into it advisedly and sacredly and you seek God uh, you pray to him and you get adequately prepared and you get premarital counseling. You can't even get married in our church uh, unless you have been properly uh, advised, unless you've gone through two classes. We've got two classes that are about 10 weeks apiece. We want to make sure you understand the sacredness of the institution, that you enter into it lightly. And here's what they did. Here's what he says in verse 11. He says they, they have profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he's loved. And look at here. He has married the daughter of a foreign God. Here's what that means. That they have chosen to get married to somebody other than whom God told them to marry. That's what Judah's problem is. They have, they have married the daughter of a foreign God. They, you know, one of the things we try to do is prepare people for marriage and tell them that there's some certain criteria that you must observe before you marry. You need to make sure of certain things about who you marry. Did God tell you to marry this person? Or is this what your flesh is telling you? Is your own nasty flesh telling you to do it? We encourage people to make sure they have their parents' blessings. Make sure you're both headed in the same spiritual direction. Make sure that you've got a word from God. There's certain things that we think ought to be observed. Make sure that you have the blessings of your parents. There are certain things that are indications, but yet people are getting married with no regard for this. They're getting married to people that one is saved and one isn't saved. One is headed toward the Lord and one is even, ain't even thinking about the Lord. That's being married and getting engaged and getting uh, connected with a foreign God. Matter of fact, verse uh, number 11 is trying to tell us and give us the warning from the Lord that you are profaning, you are treating it lightly, you are treating it with disrespect the sacred institution of marriage. And that's not the only thing they did. This is not the only thing that we regard. They not only uh, got married 
to the wrong person without the blessings and favor and direction of God. I'm warning you, hold up, let me pause. Don't let me not rush through this. Let me say to the people who got married and God didn't tell you, he's a God that will forgive you if you confess and repent and say, God, I'm sorry I did this, but guess what? He's a God that can fix what you've done. That's what I love about God. He's a God that can repair what you broke. You may have dishonored him, but give him an opportunity to fix it. You just don't walk out of it. Don't walk out of it. Maybe you didn't do it right at the start, but the God we serve has the capacity and the ability to repair. If you repent and fall on your knees and tell God that you've made a mistake and ask God to fix what's been broken, he'll do it for you. I believe it. He's an awesome and an incredible God who's looking for the opportunity and the power to make right and show you how awesome he is. But hold up. That's not the only thing they did. Slide down to verse number 13 and 14. It says, and look at it, verse 13. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Here's what the scripture says. You're crying and weeping because you made a mistake and you're asking and praying out to God to make a change, but you haven't repented. Matter of fact, you're weeping and crying. And even the offering that you're offering to God, the scripture says he doesn't even receive it anymore. And you want to know how come God doesn't see, doesn't see your tears and doesn't respond to your crying and doesn't receive your offering. Verse 14 says, yet you say, for what reason? Why has God turned his back on our weeping and our crying? Why has he not heard and received our offering? He says, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Verse 14, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. You haven't treated your bride like you should. You've disrespected your wife or your husband, put it both ways. You've disregarded them. You haven't honored them. You've given more love, more respect to others. And you have dealt with your spouse in a treacherous way. When I hear the stories of what, how people are treating their spouses in the marriage, in their marriages, it's, it's horrific to me as a pastor, when I hear the things they say and the things that they do. And I think it's my assignment is to raise the banner and raise the flag and give a warning to all of you who are not treating your spouses appropriately. It's a warning from God. It, it is, it is a, 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 a cry that no wonder some of our children, some of the children don't want to get married because they saw their parents and how they lied on each other and how they treated each other and how they disrespected each other. No wonder our children don't want to get married. They haven't seen a good model of what a marriage looks like. I've counseled so many young people who said they don't know if they want to get married or not. But marriage is a holy institution that God respects and loves. God loves that institution. He loves it. And you know what I don't know about that? God loves marriage so much, he'll bend over backwards to make yours work. He'll move heaven and hell to make your marriage work. If you head in the right direction and if you make the right choices and if you do the right things, he will move heaven and earth on your behalf to make your marriage work. That is the will of God. But we're too quick. We're too anxious. We treat marriage like it's A contract. It's not a contract, brothers and sisters. Marriage is a lifelong covenant. You just can't walk away and go and get another one. I'm talking to somebody here today who's frustrated in your marriage and you're trying to walk out. My assignment today is to challenge you and to appeal to you, to tell you to give God an opportunity to fix it. You know why people walk away from their marriage? Because they have a concept that God wants them happy. They say, God wants me to be happy. Happiness is not God's goal for you. The development of your character is what God's goal is. And I, I've discovered in my almost 40 years of being married to my bride, is there are tough days, there are difficult days, there are challenging moments. There are, there are intense fellowships. But the call of God is I believe he can heal and fix it and repair and make it whole and make it right. It's not your happiness that is the goal of God. And I hear so many people say, well, I I got released. I feel at peace. Really? Do you? 
Did you really see God? Did you read what his word say? Did his word give you peace about it? Did his word release you? I discovered in a, in, during the course of my life, God's really after maturing me. And maturity only comes through difficult days and times. Maturity comes through trials and tribulations and maturity. God brings you to a place of maturity and seasonness in your life after you've gone through, after you've suffered a while. We live in a culture today where people are not willing to suffer. They want to, when they, when they enter into the element of suffering, they hop out. So God has to put you in another suffering deal. How many marriages are you going to go through before you let God shape you and mold you and make you? I got matured because of the challenges I've gone through in life. And he's still maturing me. He's still bringing me to a place of maturity. So yes, you might have some seasons of unhappiness and you might have some challenges, but when you come out of it, when you come on the other end of it, you will be more mature. You will, you will, be, the, uh, you will be looking like Jesus. You'll have the character of the Lord Jesus. And that is his cry. It is his burden. It is his desire. It is what he wants. He wants us to have that heart. And so he tells us uh, in verse 15 right here, uh, did he not make them one? He put you in the union and made you one. That's what marriage is, taking two people and making them one. And, and then it says this, having a remnant of the spirit. And why one? Why did God make you one? Here's why. Here's why God loves the institution of marriage. Not only is it a reflection to the world of the relationship between Christ and the church, between God and his people. But here's why. Verse 15, he says, he seeks godly offsprings. He's after raising up a generation who will look more like him. He wants to raise up your children, your sons and your daughters to be a reflection of the makeup of God. He wants to birth through you children who will be those who will give glory to the kingdom of God. He wants them to be mighty warriors for his kingdom. He says, I want a godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously, verse 15, with the wife of his youth. Treat her with the respect and love. I discovered the secret. Listen to this, pastors. Listen to this, people. I discovered that one of the secrets of the success of my ministry is keeping my wife happy. Oh, yes, it can be difficult at times. It can be a challenge at moments. But I discovered that the secret of my success is keeping her happy. You keep her happy, God will bless and reward you. That's, a, that's 1 Peter 3, 7. Dwell with your wife in an understanding way. Treat her like the weaker vessel so that your prayers won't be hindered. And so I try to treat my wife as best I can with honor, with love, to be compassionate, to listen to her concerns. Even when she wants to talk on and on and on and on, I try to listen. I try to be understanding. I stop telling her I stop telling my wife when she tells me stuff that I don't understand. I stop telling her that's the devil. I started listening to her, validating her feelings, and then trying, when possible, to try to be a compassionate, understanding husband. And you know what I discovered? God honors my prayers. Some of y'all haven't had your prayers answered in a minute because you haven't respected your wife. And this text right here bears that out. He says, let none deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. Give her the honor and respect. For the Lord God of Israel says, verse number 16, he hates divorce. I'm going to close on this point. This is the deal I want you to hear. God hates divorce. He hates it. He despises it. There ain't a lot of places in scripture where I can read that God hates something, but I can tell you right here, he hates divorce. He hates it. He despises it. And I believe he despises it because he'll move heaven and earth to make it work for you. If you reach out to him, if you humble yourself and reach out to him, he has the capacity. If you'll do what he tells you to do, if you'll walk in his ways, stop seeking your happiness. It ain't about your happiness. It's about his glory and his kingdom. As a matter of fact, he hates divorce. And here's what it says. For it covers one garment. It covers one's garment with violence. I believe the rampant divorce in our culture is what leads us to have a society that runs rampant with violence. 
I believe that's one of the evidences of weak and troubled marriages and divorce. A culture filled with divorce leads to a culture of divorce, of violence from divorce. I believe if we correct this divorce issue in our culture, we'll solve the violent problems, the problems of violence. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord's of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. I want to say to you today, I know some of you have probably turned me off. Some of you have probably walked away. But those of you who are still here listening to me, get help for your marriage. Even if your spouse don't want to go, you go. And say, help me, teach me what I need to do to make my marriage work. Give me tools. Give me Give me the tools and the resources and the concepts and the principles for me to apply in my life. At First Baptist Church of Glenarden, we got a whole marriage ministry and we got counselors. We got a whole bunch of things to help you. And I would challenge you to take advantage of it. Don't just walk out. Don't just quit. God hates divorce. It destroys families. It destroys homes. It rips apart the hearts of children. Some of you are so happy, so anxious to get your own happiness that you fail to recognize that your choices are ripping the lives of your children apart. But I believe we serve a God that will give you the opportunity and the strength to bring healing to your families. Maybe somebody's listening to me today and you've already gone through a divorce. That's all right. If If you've done remarried, stay where you are. Stay where you are. And ask God to make that marriage work. Apologize to those who watched, those who were affected by your divorce. Apologize to your children. Apologize to others. And don't make it right. I'm frustrated. We're hearing people act as if it's okay to just walk away. Hey, I walked away and got married again. Ain't no no big deal. Yes, it is a big deal. It's a major deal. Repent. And I believe God will give us another chance. I don't want to make God weary, and I know you don't either. He's a God that will give you another chance. So I challenge you today. Thank you for listening to me. And I want to say to you today, some of you have made bad choices, but God is a God that will give you another chance. He'll forgive you. He'll he'll wipe your slate clean. Some of you today have been through multiple marriages. He'll forgive you. Some of you today are in troubled marriages right now. Call us. We'll pray with you. We'll give you some direction. We'll pray and intercede for you. Because that whole institution of marriage is designed to show the relationship between God and his people, Christ and his church. And he makes us one. Some of you today are not one with Jesus. He wants to be one with you. And I make an appeal for you to give us a call. We can help you meet the Lord Jesus. Email us, write us, hit the commit button. We can help you know the Lord Jesus. He's an awesome, mighty God. He'll forgive you of your sins, no matter what your sins have been in the past. He's a God who will wipe your slate clean. Give us a buzz. Make that commitment. Make that decision. Cry out to the Lord. He will make it right. Repent. Turn around. He's not too weary that he won't help you. He's got the strength to restore you and make you whole. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you for the sons of God and the daughters of God and even the people, God, today watching who are not even in relationship with you. Draw them today, Father, in Jesus' name to say yes to your will. Draw them today. Some of them today, God, have gone through the devastation of a divorce. Let them know that there is forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. Some are having troubled marriages right now. I'm praying today, God, that you would reach into these broken homes and families and marriages and bring healing is my prayer. As they reach out to you, God, let your hand reach into their circumstances and bring them life and bring them forgiveness and bring them healing in Jesus' name is my prayer. I thank you for inclining your ear to our cry, almighty God. I thank you that you love us, that you give us another chance at life. And I pray that you make it whole and heal them in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching us today. I pray the richest blessings of Almighty God in your life. Be blessed. 
Don't you just love the Word of God? The Word of God says it is sharper than any two-edged sword. I was challenged this week. I hope you were too. Please don't forget to also join us this upcoming Tuesday, July the 7th, 2020 at 7 p.m. for our Bible study. We thank you again so much for joining us where we are developing dynamic disciples. God bless you, First Baptist, and have a wonderful week. Life leads you, let's meet.